the Pan American, the George Washington, and the Flamingo, trains like those, that was primarily a first class train. You could get a coach seat, um, but as, you know, trains were not, they're not as fast as a plane, obviously. Um, so, you know, it might take you a day to get all the way to Florida. Um, you wanted to, you know, most people wanted to get a Pullman berth and have a place to sleep because the alternative was just like on the airline, kicking your head back and sleeping in the coach seat the whole way, sitting up. So, you know, most people, if they had the means, they didn't want to do that. But if they did not have the means, which was common, you did what you had to do to take the take the train that way. I grew up in Ludlow, Kentucky, in Erlanger. Um, I, when I was a kid, got my first model train when I was two. But what I really gravitated more towards was the real trains that were running. I could see them from my bedroom window going across a railroad trestle. And, um, you know, you could hear them going to bed at night. And so I really just always uh, wanted to be you know, find out more about them, and it only grew with um, time and age. You know, you can do more elaborate, you know, travels with, you know, private cars of that. Um, there's also a uh, trip across Canada that you can do in the Canadian Rockies. It's very similar um, that you get to see amazing scenery. Um, and, but really, you know, in certain places of this nation, as far as passenger travel is concerned, um, in the northeast of the United States, um, you can get on a train in Philadelphia or Boston or New York City, Washington, go in between cities like that, and it's pretty competitive that you can, uh, by the time you get on a plane and go through security, your, your train would probably be there by now. So, and the same is true, there's efficient services in um, Florida and also uh, um, in uh, California where the train is not something that you just take because you're nostalgic. You take it because you want to get somewhere and it's just as efficient, if not more efficient and cost effective than taking a plane. But typically you would be up there by yourself most of the time in a, a cabin like this, since we're on the CNO, we'll call it a cabin. And um, it, you, it would be anywhere from an eight hour to a 12 hour job, depending on the day and the staffing. But um, you would be uh, not only list in later years listening to the radio, you would be watching a switchboard that lit up in your office that had different routes. So you, they, they almost looked like, you know, with colored tape white, and they, they would have little lights on them. The board would light up. So you, uh, that's called a, a CTC board, and you would watch your interlocking and communicate with the trains via t um, and the dispatcher and the dispatcher is the person in main office and that would be probably in Cincinnati uh, but it could be elsewhere that's um, the, uh, giving the, the go to the trains to say you're good to go this route and so the tower operator would make sure that the switches were aligned properly because think bad things happened when they aren't aligned properly you can crash into another train and make sure that the trains um, uh, it, it were monitored essentially to you know eyes on it so when it cleared he would make sure that he let the dispatcher know electronically and via telegraph radio that the block was clear a block is just a section of track so he'd say that section of tracks clear we can have another train